Reconciliation Ministries International presents World Missions. No one has the right to come to this world and leave it the way he or she found it. Dr. Gee and Ilka Pei have answered the call, preaching the gospel of power in more than 100 countries. Their vision is the world. Their passion is for souls. Their mission is to equip believers, training them in the supernatural, teaching them how to display the championship quality of Jesus in every area of their lives. As long as you stay aligned with the Word of God, something is moving in the spiritual dimension of the universe. And before too long, there's going to be interference between the spiritual world and the natural world. Natural laws are going to be broken. You are going to be healed. You are going to be delivered. God's going to provide for you. Something's going to happen. You're going to break beyond limitations. Dr. Guy and Ilka travel the world reaching this generation with the love of Jesus Christ, sharing the message of God's power, signs and wonders through church services, miracle crusades, leadership conferences, mission trips, training seminars, Bible schools, TV and media, women's conferences, social outreaches, and literature in different languages. His grace covers your weakness. His grace covers all what makes you nothing. His grace covers your shame. His grace covers your pain. His grace covers your hurt. His grace covers your betrayal. His grace covers your downfall. And that's why you can say, I am born to win. I am born to win. I'm not going to call myself a dead dog anymore. I'm not going to sit at home in self-pity comparing myself with others. But I know that I have a covenant with a king of kings. God is confirming his word. The sick are healed. The deaf are hearing. Even the dead have been raised from the dead. With their social and humanitarian outreach, Dr. Guy and Ilka Pei help the poor by building water wells and providing food. They also help indigenous pastors around the world. They believe that as missionaries to the nations, we need to have more than just the language of words. We also need the language of actions. Through their marketplace ministry, they empower business people to be successful by applying kingdom and biblical principles in their business. Through their prayer ministry, they organize and mobilize prayer around the world through the Prayer Shield Network. You can submit your prayer request and you can join the world prayer team at www.gepay.com. To God be the glory. It is miracle time. It is miracle that God, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is King. I want to thank you for being here today. This is the day that the Lord has made. We'll, we'll rejoice and be glad in it. Well, welcome today. I want to please let me know where you're watching from. Click the like button. Click the love button. Glory be to God. Praise be to God. Love, 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 love. I love this song by Kirk Franklin. I don't own the right to this song, but it says love. 
a word that comes and go. But few people really know what it really means to love somebody. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. I love that song. Love, 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 love. Have you ever been in love? Well, have you ever been? Please put in the comment section. Have you ever been in love? Have you ever felt that that feeling, those chemicals, feeling like you were in love in a relationship? In love, in love. It's been the the topic that we've been talking about the last several broadcasts. Falling in love. You know, we talk about the fact that uh, you can have a special love, love that can make your relationship permanent. Then we talk about what it means uh, to be in a relationship, to find Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. And we're moving the conversation forward today. We're talking about how to love your man and love your woman. You know, uh, Valentine, Valentine is not really a Christian holiday. It's not really a Christian holiday. But we understand John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So when we talk about love, is in the context, spiritual context of understanding the love that God provided for us and the kind of love that we can express towards one another. Amen. So very good. Thank you for being here today. I can see St. Augustine is in Florida is in the house. Eunice, Louisiana is in the house. Finland is in the house. The Netherlands in the house. Thank you for being here. Please click the like button. Click the love button. Uh, the, the love button. I will encourage you to interact today. I think it was Charles Feeney that said that if Mr. Amen is Mr. Wet Eye are not present in the meeting, there will be no revival. And I added to that to the fact that if Mr. Hallelujah and Mr. Glory are not present in the meeting, there will be no revival. So let's start with a word of prayer today. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we Thank you for this day. We declare that this is the day that the Lord has made. We'll, we'll rejoice and be glad in it. We ask you to give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to receive, a will to obey, and faith to act. In the name of Jesus, we take our position in Christ, and we take authority over every spirit that does not confess the name of Jesus. We command them to leave this place. We declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, Jesus Christ is is king. We say preach Holy Spirit, teach Holy Spirit, prophesy Holy Spirit, heal the sick God, do what only you can do, and take all the glory in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Can you burn with a shout and say amen? I would encourage you to click the like button, click the share button, tag somebody on this video. In this, in this day and age where so many people are struggling with the concept of relationship and doing the relation, relationship the right way. Amen? Now, um, this is very important. Falling in love, falling in love. Somebody say falling in love. Please put this in the comment section. Falling in love, falling in love, in love, in love. Have you ever been in love? Now, listen, love is not just emotions. Love is not just emotions. Hey, Rosie, love is not, is not just emotions. Listen, falling in love is easy to do, almost effortless. But losing that feel that 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 feeling is not that hard to do either. You understand me? Uh, listen, emotions are generated by chem by a chemical reaction. Emotions are generated by a chemical reaction that changes every five seconds. All right, this is very important. So, what does that mean? That means that falling in in love is easy to do. As a matter of fact, is effortless. Now, if I love you because of what I feel, I may lose my love in five minutes. All right. Have you ever heard this statement? We fell out of love with each other. We don't love each other anymore. What does that mean? Well, it simply means that the chemicals have changed. In other words, what you're saying is the way I used to look at you and the kind of feelings that were generated when I look at you, those feelings are no longer there. You are now bigger, you're fatter, less attractive. You change on me. The feelings have changed. When I look at you, the chemicals have changed. After four children, you don't look the same. Hello? Now, this is not what people say, but that's the undertone when people say, I don't love you anymore. You know, listen, love is a choice, all right? Love is not just emotion. Love is a choice. You choose to love. Love is an act of the will. 
Love is a decision to commit to meet the need of another person for the rest of their lives without expectation. All right? Do not trust your feelings because like the rest of creations, your feelings were victims of the fall. We talk about this extensively in our previous broadcast. If you miss it, you have to go back and watch it, you know, on its, on its Miracle Time private group page. All right? This is very important. You need to learn how to remove certain to remove feelings out of some aspect of your relationship. It starts with feeling, but it cannot it cannot survive on feeling. So we started there by talking about falling in love. Then the next segment that we did was how to identify Mr. Right of Mrs. Right. So we're moving the conversation forward. We're administering now in this next two or three messages, or maybe one message, depending on how far we go, on loving your man or loving your woman. Please put this on the comment section, loving my man. Or loving my woman. If you ever fall in love, the question then becomes: How do you effectively love your man, or love, or love your woman? So we need to understand that men and women are fundamentally different. All right, we are wired differently, and those differences are exciting in the beginning, but after a while, if you don't know how to manage the differences between men and women you are going to have serious problem loving your man or loving your woman. You understand that Dr. Sperry, uh, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970, discovered, he did a study in which he featured the fact that between the 16th and 26th week of gestation, uh, baby boys have a chemical reaction that slows the development of the brain the right side of the brain, which baby girls do not have. Uh, so which confirm what every woman already knows, that every man is born brain damaged, all right? This is very important. So you got to understand that men and women are different, all right? Um, most women are predominantly right brain, but also left brain oriented. But most men are predominantly left brain oriented. And the left brain and right brain aspect of a man and a woman will affect every aspect of your relationship. So we are different. So if we don't understand those differences, uh, you will have serious problems in, in the relationship. All right. This is very important. So we need to understand that the need of a woman and the need of a man are fundamentally different. All right. We're going to dive into this in, in depth. But let me say this to you. All right. The reason why there are frustrations in the relationship sometimes is because of misguided expectations, because we project our expectations based on our needs on the relationship. And so and because we have so many different needs, we, we have different needs as men than women or, vi or vice versa. It becomes a problem in the relationship. All right. And you understand that love it, itself is not enough to safeguard a relationship. What will help a relationship survive and go long term is the ability, the knowledge and the understanding, the wisdom to know how to live with someone that is different than you. And to know how to live with someone that is different than you, you need to understand their different needs. All right. So the question becomes, please put this on the comment section. What are the need of a man and what are the need of a woman? I'm glad you asked the question. Listen, the first need of a woman, I'm going to talk about this. The first need of a woman is not uh, sex. It is affection. Please put this on the comment section. Affection. So let's say affection. Oh, yeah. Affection. Affection and affection is not sex, man. Affection is you opening the door for her. Affection is you putting the toilet seat after you pee. Affection is you sending her a text during the day to tell her that you're thinking about her. Affection, glory be to God, is buying her flowers for no special reason, just because you uh, you were thinking about her. Come on, somebody. Affection, 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 affection. Affection is not sex, all right? So many men confuse affection with sex. No, no, no. Affection may get you there to the sex part, but affection is not sex. So the first need of a woman is affection. Somebody say affection, affection. All right. 
Please put this on the comment section. This is very important. Affection. So affection is not sex. Affection is not sex, right? So affection is you, you know, holding her hand. And affection is you kissing her, you know, in front of your ex-girlfriend. Affection. Affection. All right? Now, this is very important. All right? A lot of men don't understand this, all right? So they want to, to speed up to the sex and miss the affection. Now, this is very important. So the first need of a woman is affection. Let me ask you a question, men. Do you love gas station? No. Do you love the smell of gasoline? No. But when your car has a need of gasoline, what do you do? You take it to the gas station, all right? A woman does not want affection she needs affection the second need of a woman is please put this on the comments on, on on the comment section is conversation somebody say conversation conversation she has a need to talk she has a need to talk and when i talk about the need of talking it doesn't simply mean that you know you need to answer sometimes you just need to listen man to what she has to say all right that's very important her second need is conversation she has a need to talk all right third need is honesty and openness she wants to have your secret man she she glows when she have your secret never let uh, another woman know something about you before your wife or your girlfriend you know honesty and openness she loves that all right this is very important thank you for putting that uh, gwen lebron hurry uh this is very important affection conversation Honesty and openness. Uh, third need of a woman is financial support. No matter how much money a woman makes, she still needs financial support. All right? Very important. Uh, next need is family commitment. Family commitment. She wants you to be a committed man, to be a one-woman man, to love your children, to love your family. All right? Let's switch it to the other side. All right? What are the needs of a man? The primary, the primary need of a man, it's sex. Somebody says sex. Oh, yes, baby. His engines are running. He has a lot of need for sex. And folks, ladies, you need to understand this. Sex, his first need is sex. The second need is sex. The third need is sex. Sex, sex. <laughs> oh, a man needs sex. Lady, do you, do you like the smell of gasoline? <laughs> do you do you love the gas station but when your car has need of gasoline what do you do well you take it to the gas station all right so it's the same thing your man doesn't your man doesn't want sex he needs sex he has that testosterone going on <laughs> somebody jokingly said that it's interesting that you know in the early days before children you know uh Testosterone runs strongly even among ladies, but a wedding cake will kill the testosterone. But listen, a man doesn't want sex. A man needs sex. All right. So, ladies, you need to post a sign saying that, you know, uh, that your gas station is open 24-7 a day with premium gasoline available. All right. <laughs> so sex, sex, sex. Okay. The first need of a man is sex. His second need is recreation and companionship. All right. He likes to he likes to go hang out before he was married to you, ladies. He used to go out to the bars and hang with his friends. Or I mean, if he's not a Christian man, uh, he used to go out and hang out with his friends. But now he's married. So you need to go sometimes hang out with him to the football games or you know, to the basketball games or to watch the game with him. The second is is recreation, recreation and companionship. All right. His third need is an attractive spouse. Somebody say an attractive spouse. Oh, yes. Ladies. Um, well, somebody said that what if the wife's sex drive is actually higher than the husband? I like that question. They said, what if the, the, the wife's sexual drive is actually higher than the husband? That simply means that the husband has to give it up. So the husband has to give it up. If the wife's sexual drive is higher the men, listen, sex is, 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 is what is due. You know, the Bible calls it due benevolence. It's like when you, 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 you rent a place at the end of the month, you need to pay the rent. All right. 
when you have a mortgage, you have to pay it every month. You know, sex is due. You know, the scripture says well, it's it's part of the covenant. So you have to you have to give it up, ladies. You have to give it up, man, both ways. You know, don't ever don't turn your man. I understand that sometimes, uh, you know, a woman has her need for affection is bigger than her need for sex because she had a difficult days with children. She had a difficult day uh, with uh, her job, you know, and she probably just need to be held. She doesn't have a need for sex. And sometimes a man may have a different need. But what you got to realize, ladies and gentlemen, is that that need has to be met when it's there. And it's a right need, but sometimes it's met the wrong way. All right. And ladies, what you don't want, or men, what you don't want, you don't want that your spouse to go somewhere else to get that need met. They will be in sin, but that is a need that is legitimate. So you have to meet that need. All right. Very important. That was a good question. That was a very good question. Very good. Moving forward. Now, listen, uh, recreation and companion, com, com, companion, companionship. Very important. The next thing is. Uh, next thing is the next need of a man is an attractive spouse. What do I mean for an attractive spouse? I don't need that she needs to be the most beautiful woman in the world. Yes, beauty is, is relative. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. So what one person finds attractive, another person may not find attractive. But what I mean by that that person needs to be attractive Simply means that they need to take care of themselves. It's interesting that some people, before they get married, they go to the gym, they 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 clean up pretty nicely, they dress nicely, uh, you know, they 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 take care of themselves. They wear cologne, you know, and you know, some people even when they're dating, they they watch what they eat, you know, uh, you know, and all of those things. And then when they get married, they just take their partner for granted. They stop taking care of themselves after a couple of children. No, 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 no. You need to keep yourself, you know, I understand the issues when people have medical conditions and they gain weight and all of those things, but you need to keep yourself attractive. Listen, listen, every woman is beautiful. I believe that. But you got to keep yourself attractive. All right. Keep yourself sexy. Sexy means sexually attractive. So, you know, don't let your husband go out there and let his eyes wander. You know, let him, you know, let him know that, you know, and vice versa. Don't let your woman, you know, uh, go out there and look for something else. No, you know, keep it hot at home by staying attractive. A man would love, a man love to have an attractive spouse. Take care of your teeth. Brush your teeth. Put on some makeup. Take care of your hair. And wear some sexy underwear. Put away your grandma underwear. Be attractive. Be sexually attractive to your husband. Be sexy. Listen, sexy is for your husband. Sexy is not for men in the street. Some of you ladies, you dress provocatively. And then you get cut call and people flirt, try to flirt with you. It's because of the way you dress up, you know. Listen, sexy is for your husband. Sexy is for your, for your wife. Sexy is for your future husband, for your future. You know, when people are on a hunting season, they try to be sexy. They, you know, they dress up nicely and they do all those things. And then when they get married, they just throw it away out of the window. Hello? Listen, this is a good preaching right now. I know you won't, you won't hear this behind your pulpit on Sunday morning. But I'm telling you, this the stuff that I'm preaching about. This will save your relationship right there. That affair, that affair that happened. Sometimes affair happens because people try to go outside the marriage to meet some need that were designed to be met in the marriage. All right, so you gotta be you gotta be able to you gotta be able to keep things exciting. An attractive spouse, an attractive spouse, an attractive spouse in both directions. All right. Keep yourself attractive just because you put the ring on it. Just because you married somebody, that doesn't mean that you have to stop chasing them. All right. Continue to call each other girlfriend and boyfriend. I'm still my wife is still my girlfriend. And sometimes I put posts on Facebook, you know, with my girlfriend and people say, you guys are not married. You've been traveling together for so many years and you're not married. No, no, no. We're married, but she's still my girlfriend. All right. This is very important. So an attractive spouse, somebody say an attractive spouse, spouse is very important. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, but you still need to have an attractive spouse. So 
keep it going, ladies. Keep it going, man. Go to the gym. Do whatever you have to do. Amen. Next, next, um, we talk about the need of a man and the need of a woman. We talk about the fact that it's important for you to understand the person you marry with. And one of the primary ways to understand them is understanding their needs. But sometimes frustrations happen in a marriage, in a relationship, because we project our need on the other person. Yet we are so wired, we are wired so differently that we have different needs, all right? So we said the primary need of a woman is what? Glory be to God. It is an affection, conversation, honesty, openness, financial support, family, commitment. The primary need of a man is sexual fulfillment. The primary need of a, of a man is attract an attract uh, recreation companionship, an attractive spouse. Listen to this, domestic support. Please put this on the comment section. A man needs domestic support. This is where some of you ladies are going wrong. A man goes out there and works hard. And of course, it's, of course, in this world today, both men and women are working. But a lot of men are going out there working hard. And when he comes home, he doesn't need to go into an antagonistic environment. He doesn't need to come to a uh, to a uh, to a to a to a home to a home that is antagonistic to him, where the the atmosphere is hostile. So, ladies, make sure make sure you create an environment at the house that is conducive to welcoming your husband when he comes home. Some lady has such naggers, but men can be also naggers, all right? But this is very important to understand. So many ladies are nagging all the time. Sometimes, yeah, that's why your husband doesn't want to come home because he knows that you're going to be running your mouth, always being negative, never encouraging. This is very important that you create an atmosphere in the house where there is domestic support. Listen, you know, the next need of a man is what? Is admiration. Please put this on the comment section. Admiration. I know they won't tell you that. I know you won't hear it from your church, from the pulpit. But I'm going to tell you, a lot of men are insecure. And they get their identity from their jobs. The biggest need, the biggest fear of a man is not to succeed and to fail. And the biggest need, the biggest, the biggest need of a woman is, is the, the, the biggest fear of a woman is not to be loved and to be abandoned. So man, a woman has need. She needs to hear, I love you. Even if she says, I don't need it, I don't need it. I'm telling you, she's lying. She needs it. She needs to be, she needs to, she, she needs to hear from you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. She needs to hear that. The biggest fear of a woman is not to be loved and to be abandoned. She, a woman needs security. The biggest fear of a man is to not to succeed and to fail. So a lot of men struggle with, with insecurity. So a lot of men have a need for admiration. That's why he will fall in love with a secretary or another woman that is not even half as beautiful as his wife. Why? Because that woman has that need met, the need of admiration. A secretary that it's paid to be nice to her boss. Sometimes it's, it's easy for her husband, for, for her boss to fall in love with her because she celebrates him all day, all days, all day long. Oh, you're so nice, sir. You look good today. Uh, you, you're such a great boss. You're such a great boss. You're such a great man. She sings her praises and she's paid to be nice to him. At, but at home, the woman is mean and she, she you know, she, she doesn't compliment her husband. And guess what? He falls in love. And sometimes he will hear things like this in his job. What well, your wife doesn't need, what she, she doesn't know what she, she has. You know, if I wasn't married, you know, I, you know I, I could fall in love with you easily. So admiration, admiration, admiration. Ladies, don't let, don't let somebody else out compliment your husband. You know, be the first one to compliment your husband. Be the first one to compliment your spouse. Amen. This is very important. This is very important. So these are some of the parameters that we're going to work with. You need to admire. You need to admire your spouse. Amen. I love it when I preach, when we, when we go to conferences and stuff, and, and stuff like that. You know, um, <laughs> uh, it's very interesting because my wife, I mean, my wife, uh, uh, 
is always the first one to tell me, baby, your preaching was good. She tells me, I love to hear you more than any other preachers, you know. That was good, but I love to hear you. So she always compliments me. And listen, admiration is real. Listen, if you start to do these things, you're going to see your husband change. If you start to admire your husband, you're going to see him change. You're going to see his attention goes towards you. You'll be amazed. A man will wear his pants higher and look like a fool walking down the street, but feel confident. Why? Because his wife says he looks good. Ladies, God has given to you the power of influence. With one word, you can crush your husband. With one word, you can lift him up. So use your power of influence to lift your husband up. Amen. God has given you the power of influence. Now, practically, I'm going to take you into a journey. I may give you two points on this, and then we're going to close. I'm, on, I'm, in, I'm in California. I'm on the road. I'm going to give you two points here. Uh, how do you love? Uh, how do you love your? Uh, how do you love your woman? All right. How do you love your woman? I'm glad you asked the question. I'm going to start with the woman and then I'm going to shift, uh, uh, switch with the man. It's going to be give and take both sides. How practically do you love your woman? All right. Ephesians chapter 5, 25 and 8 says, husband, husband, love your wives, love your wives. You know, this teaching is so good. I'm telling you, you know, uh, by the way, I, if you love what I'm teaching, I'm teaching, uh, I'm teaching from my book. OK, uh, Marriage Rocks, you know, you can get a copy of it uh, on Amazon, a key e Kindle version of it on Amazon. You can get a hard copy on our website, you know, tremendous teaching. And as far as far as as well as other books that are out there, you can get this on our website. This book, I'm telling you, will transform your life. We have people attending our seminars that have been married for 50 years, six years. They said this is some of the best teachings on marriage they've ever heard. All right. So how do you love your woman, man? How do you love your woman? We're going to show you how to do it practically. We're not just going to beat you on the head. We're going to show you how to do it. All right. Somebody say how to do it. All right. So now listen, how do you love your woman? So we're going to give it on both sides. We're going to show the man and the woman. It's going to be, we're going to talk to the woman, uh, to the man, and then we're going to talk to the woman. All right. Let's talk to the man for just a little bit. How do you love your woman? How do you love your woman? I'm glad you asked the question. Ephesians chapter five, verse 25. Husband. Love your wives, all right? Husband, love your wives. Colossians chapter 3, verse 19 says what? It says, husband, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Oh boy, isn't that tough? Every woman wants her man to love her, all right? Every woman wants her man to love her. To honor her is to love her, and to love her is to honor her. Oh, that's good preaching. Please put this on the comment section. I'm going to say it again. Every woman wants her man to love her. I remember John Edward, a president, presidential candidate, running for president in the United States uh, for the U.S. Uh, presidency. And he, uh, he cheated on his wife who had breast cancer. And when they interview his wife and she said, all I ever wanted is for my husband to love me. Isn't that interesting? Listen, every woman wants her man to love her. And I'm going to tell you, to honor her is to love her, and to love her is to honor her. So how do you love her? How do you love her, man? Number one, please put this on the comment section, love her leadfully. I know this is not a, a an English word, but I made it. I made it. Uh, you know, I made this. I made this word up, but it's to express my thought on what I am talking about, okay? Love her leadfully, leadfully, L-E-A-D, and then hyphen F-U-F-U-L-L-Y. Love her leadfully. Somebody put this on the comment section. Love her leadfully. Listen, if a man, if a man, if a man, listen to this. If a man expects his woman to be an angel, he first has to create a heaven for her. Oh boy, is that good or what? If a man expect his woman to be an angel for her, he first has to create a heaven for her. Angels don't live in hell. Demons do. All right? A woman is like a garden. Whatever is, listen, whatever you plant is what you're going to harvest. A woman is like an incubator. She does not produce anything. An incubator does not produce anything. All right? But whatever you put in the incubator, 
the incubator is going to take it and it's going to multiply it and it's going to produce something out of it. All right. This is the way a woman is. A woman is like an incubator. If you give her, uh, you know, groceries, glory be to God, she is going to give you a meal. If you give her, if you build her a house, she's going to turn it into a home. Glory be to God. If you give her a sperm seed, she would take it and multiply it and produce children. A woman is like an incubator. She does not produce anything, but it's whatever you give to her. She would take it and multiply it and produce it and give it back to you. If you give her problems, she's going to take it and multiply it and send it back to you and give you hell. Hello? A woman can sit in a relationship quietly for years and say nothing and take verbal abuse, mental abuse, but there comes a day where she's going to go off on you and she's going to release hell and you don't want it. You're going to be destroyed. So if a man expect a woman to be an angel, he first have to create a heaven on earth. Angels don't live in hell. Demons do. So she's like a garden. Whatever you plant in it, that's what you're going to get. All right. So love her leadfully. Ephesians 5, 23 says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Listen, Philippians chapter 4, verse, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, Christ Jesus who thought he, uh, Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count it equally with God, to be grasped, but empty himself by taking the form of a servant. Listen, a man's role in marriage is to be a loving leader. Please put this in, 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 in the comment section. A man, a man, a man role in marriage, a man role in marriage is to be a loving leader. A loving leader. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Christ Jesus. Who thought he was in the form of God. Did not take it equality with God. How can you serve your bride and family at best? How can you do it at best? Follow the example of Christ. Amen. Follow the example of Christ. Somebody say follow the example of Christ. Christ was humble, humble and a servant. He did not take it robbery to be equal with God. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. Husband, I call to lead their families in a loving, Christ-like way. Doing so is a massive privilege and a huge responsibility. If a husband leads and love like Christ, the wife will feel more honored, cherished, and blessed than ever before. All right? The best marriage in the world is two servants in love. The worst marriage in the world is two masters in love. I'm going to say one more time. This is so good. Glory be to God. This is so good. Glory be to God. Here's what I say. The best marriage in the world is two servants in love. The worst marriage in, in, in the world is two masters in love. All right? Very important. Glory be to God. Headship is leadership. Headship is leadership and not any kind of leadership. Headship is a leadership of love. Spiritual leadership is no, lesson, no license for men to do what they want to do. Spiritual leadership is not a license for men to do what they want to do. It is empowerment to do what they ought to do. I'm going to say one more time. It is empowerment to do what they ought to do. It is not a general commanding his army or a computer analyst pushing the right buttons or a master in charge of his palace or place. The image here is not a mighty, is not a mighty potentate. All right. Glory be to God. Siding, sitting on his throne, ruling his cowering subject with an iron head. Hello. The image here is not that of a mighty potentate sitting on his throne, ruling his cowering subject with, uh, with an iron head. It is more like a conductor standing on his box, directing a symphony. Delicate, but definite. Subdued, yet powerful. 
It is taking his God-given responsibility to care for his wife and family and lead them in love towards the goal which God has chosen for them. Very important. This is very important. Biblical submission and bullying don't mix. Husband, you are, you are in charge with the holy, loving leadership of your wife. There's nothing uh, dictatorial or selfish in this prescription. Your love is to be strong, so strong that it mirrors Christ's love for the church, so committed that you will unquestioningly die to save her, and so powerful that it is indistinguishable from love of yourself. Very important. What a challenge and what a privilege to join with God and your wife in this holy partnership. For as you fulfill your role as head of the house, you will encounter blessings you never imagined. A godly man uses wisdom to lead his family, not muscles. I'm going to say it one more time. A godly man lead his family with wisdom, not muscles. A godly man uses wisdom to lead his family, not muscles. A woman wants a man with confidence in himself, in her, in their relationship. The difference between a boss and a leader is that a boss says go and a leader says let's go. She wants him to lead her and her children with kindness and understanding. She wants him to be firm yet gentle. Men lead with wisdom, vision, glory be to God. Lead with wisdom, lead with vision. Vision is simply this, knowing where you are and where you're headed. A leader is a person with a magnet in his heart and compass, compass in his head. A leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and show the way. All leaders are learners. If you ever stop learning, you will stop leading. In the Christian home, the family should follow the leader willingly. The Christian father and husband should not find it necessary to force his family to be obedient. A godly leader exhibits a stillness, maturity, and a determination to follow the will of God for himself and for his family. He must hear God's voice clearly to follow God fully. A woman wants a man who will consult the Lord and her before major decision is made to ensure that he makes the right decision all the time. Is this helping anybody? Come on, somebody. A leader's responsibility is to lead, and that entails decision-making. Listen, with the rise of the feminist movement, traditional roles for men have been called into questions, including the decision, decision-making. As a result, many men are less sure of themselves. And this is this reflection in their inability to make wise and timely decisions. Why this new, listen to this, we have to understand that this, this power works in a way that we have to be able to function as leaders, function in the position that God has put all of us. Very important. Marriage is a joint effort, all right? So Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, verse 8 says, the two shall become one flesh. So they are not more than two, but one flesh. Somebody say one flesh. One flesh. Somebody say one flesh. One flesh. Somebody say one flesh. This is very important. This means that both parties must work together for the betterment of their marriage, family, and life. Two spouses are better than one when they are one. Unity means you in I and I in you. I'm going to say it again. You in I and I in you. All right. The healthier, the healthiest couples have learned that every decisions they make as a, as individuals will have some level of impact on each other. So they respect respectfully and thoughtfully consult each other in every decision. Husband, discuss the situation in depth with your wife. Give careful consideration to her input. It's interesting that my car, you know, I service my car in a dealership, you know, in Dallas. And, uh, and as I was servicing uh, my car, you know, 
they asked me questions about what they needed to do with the car. I said, let me first call my wife, you know, and they asked me the question several times and I called my wife. And so the guy at the dealership who was like, happened to be a Muslim asked me and said, do you always ask your wife for everything? You know, I thought this was your car. I said, yes, it is my car, but I always like to ask my wife, you know, what she thinks about things because she has a different, a different perspective. You understand me? So, you know, women may have a different perspective. So it's always important to consult with each other. Amen. So husband, discuss the situation in depth with your wife. Give careful consideration to her input. Romans chapter 12 verse 10 says, honor one another above yourself. That means that both parties must work together for the betterment of their marriage, family, and life. Two spouses are better than one. Amen? So this is very important. Value your wife's opinion and voice as much as you do your own. Come to a decision as a married couple that you can both get behind while you ask God for special wisdom. Wisdom, James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach and it will be given to him when it is time to do the right thing time to make tough decision it is time for the husband to step forward and assume responsibility husband you get a vote she get a vote you get the decision vote amen once you have decided husband lead with follow through don't fizzle out no matter how busy you are be responsible when you make a mistake man be man enough to own it and do what you can do to make restitution. Restitution, Apologize and ask for forgiveness. It is beneficial to making restitution complete. It's not important for you to be perfect, but it's crit critical for you to recognize your mistake and take responsibility for them. Lead and manage your family. The word husband is two words put together. In the original Latin language, husband means housebound. Please put this on the comment section. Housebound. Housebound. The house bound is the one who bounds, who bound the house, who binds the house together. The one who keeps the family together. Husband, husband, you're called to keep the family together. So I'm going to make one more point, one more point about the lady. So I tell you, it's two-sided. This teaching is two-sided. We talk about what the men ought to do. We talk about what the women are to do. So ladies, um, it's very important for you to understand that in scriptures, you know, the Bible never tells a woman to love her husband, but the Bible tells a woman to respect your husband. Why? Because a man receives love different than women. a woman does. This is very important. The way a woman, a man, respect, uh, receives love is through respect. True respect. Somebody say respect. All right? So how do you love your man? It's by respecting him. So how do you respect your man? I'm glad you asked the question. A happy wife sometimes has the best husband, but more often makes the best husband she has. I'm going to say this one more time. A happy wife sometimes has the best husband, but more often makes the best husband she has. In other words, you have, to, you have the power to make your man the best husband. All right? How do you do it? It's by respecting him. By respecting him. You want to kill that love in your relationship disrespect your husband that's the way to kill the, that relationship excuse me all right that's the way to, that's the way that's the way you do it now one of the way you respect your husband is by is by submitting to him no woman wants to be in submission to a man who isn't in submission to god man i want you to understand that ephesians chapter 5 verse 22 and 23, it says, wives, submit to, to your own husband as the Lord. All right. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ, the head of the church and give himself for her, that he might sanctify her and so on and so on. First Peter three and one wives, likewise, be submissive to your husband. And even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be one by the conduct of their wives. So women, this is what the Bible says. Again, submission is a dirty word, but I already explained the balanced approach of how a man needs to lead his family. Submission is, is a murky word for many today, but God has order for the house, all right? 
Submission does not, does not mean that men, men are better than women or more significant. It simply means that God has assigned a different role to the man than the woman. All right? Think about what is more important to your car, the steering wheel or the tire, the carburetor or the radiator, the heater or the air conditioner. They are all important because they have different assignments. What submission to your husband means is that you allow him to the space to steer the family. A wise woman realizes that two captains sink the ship and two cooks spoil the broth. All right? This is very important. All right? She honors her husband as the head of the family. Most women like a man that lead, and most men can't stand a woman that takes charge. <laughs> Did you hear that? Woman, your submission is an invitation for your husband to lead. Very important. As a wife, your submission creates a void that serves as an invitation. And when your husband does, not, does step up, you need to encourage him. Amen? Say things like, that's what I love in my man, leadership. All right? Then watch him come alive. Blessed is a man who marry a woman clever enough to allow him to be a leader in their home. Although she can do many things as well as her husband and some things even better than him, she voluntarily submits to him out of, her, out of, out of obedience to the Lord. Amen. God has given men the task to lead the family. This is very important. God has given men the task to lead the family. Okay. Woman, you may be smarter. You may have more degrees. Hello. But the man is still called to lead. Very important. All right. Every household need one, needs one leader with one vision. Two visions will create division and confusion. One of the worst trend disasters in history occurred in El Torino Tunnel in Leon, Spain, on January the 3rd, 1944. Over 500 people died during that accident. The train was one of those long passenger trains with an engine on both ends. On this particular day, when the train went into the El Toro Tunnel, the engine of the front stalled. When the front engine stopped, the engineer on the back engine started up his engine to back the train out of the tunnel. At the same time, however, the front engineer managed to get the front engine started again and attempted to continue the journey. Neither engineer had any way of communicating with the other. Both engineers thought that they simply needed more power. They continued to pull in both directions for several minutes. Hundreds of passengers on the train in the tunnel died of carbon monoxide poisoning because the train could not make up its mind which way to go. All right? The people on the train died because the train had one too many engineers. Men... It's her verse, not yours, all right? That means that you shouldn't quote it at your wife. So two leaders, two captains sink the ship, two cooks spoil the broth, the, the, the broth, all right? So this verse, women submit to your husband, is not yours to quote. That means that you shouldn't quote it at your wife. It's, it's hers to obey, not yours to demand. If she's not doing it, all you can do is be kind and be the kind of leader it will be a joy to submit to. You play your role and trust God with hers. Today, unfortunately, sometimes men do not want to lead and women do not want to follow. Also, submission doesn't mean putting up with abuse. It's possible to obey without submitting. Obedience is an outward action while submission is an inward attitude. God calls us not to just to obey, but also to submit. A mother ordered her disobedient son to sit in the corner. After a couple of minutes of sitting, he told his mother, I'm sitting down, but outside, I'm still standing on the inside. I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. He obeyed, but he didn't submit. All right. Submission is an attitude of the heart. Glory be to God, a daily journey of faith where you choose to see Jesus in your marriage, not just leadership style from your husband. Submission is not about inferiority or superiority. It's about sacrifice. 
Husband and wife belongs to each other. Glory be to God. Well, this is where I'm going to stop today. I hope this has been a blessing to you today. We're going to receive uh, an offering. Glory be to God. You know, we bring fresh teachings here. Uh, it's, uh, it's miracle time. And I want to encourage all of you today to sow a seed. We have a cash app. We have a PayPal app. Glory be to God. There's a link in the comment section where you can sow your seed, where you can give. If you're watching the replay, we are encouraging you to give as well. Glory be to God. Uh, sow your seed. You can give your seed through uh, the cash app. You can give your seed uh, through the uh, PayPal app. Those of you in Europe, you can give through the IBAM number. Uh, I want to give you a scripture verse here about, about giving. The scripture says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. And God will cause men to give, to give unto you. Now, it's important for us to uh, really uh, have the understanding that offering is something that God instituted. Do you realize that Jesus had people who supported him in his ministry? That Jesus had partners? You can find it in the scripture. I'm not making this up. You can find this in the scriptures in Luke chapter 8, verse 3. It says here, Joanna, the wife of Shusa, the manager of Herod household, Susanna and many others, these women were helping to support them out of their own means. Glory be to God. Uh, this is very important. Um, this is very important. Luke chapter 3. I'm going to answer your question after a while, ja uh, Jacqueline. Um, uh, contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. So clearly there were people who supported Jesus in, in his ministry. You have people who partner with him. We encourage you to partner with this ministry. Also here in this particular verse uh, in, in Mark chapter 5, we see Jesus taking an offering in Mark chapter 12. Jesus taking an offering and he not only did he take the offering, he watched what people gave. Not only did he watch what people gave, and, but he also uh, commented on the giving. He said there were wealthy people that gave. There were poor people that gave. So both wealthy and poor people are encouraged to give. Amen. But then he commented and said that a poor widow gave more than the wealthy people. Why? Because he said she gave out of her abundance and they give out of their overflow. In other words, you always have to give in proportion to how much God has blessed you. Amen. So give, stretch, give generously. And Hebrew chapter 7 verse 8 says, Here mortal men receive the tithe. But there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. So your offering has two dimensions. Here on, uh, here on this side of heaven, man receives it, receives your offering. But in heaven, God receives it. So Philippians chapter 4, Paul says, um, No church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. So you have to be able to communicate with the ministry. When a ministry is a blessing to you, how do you respond? You respond with your giving. You respond with your giving. Amen. And Paul said, no one, no church communicated with me with giving and receiving. Galatians 6 verse 6 says, but let him who is taught in the word shed all good things with him who teaches. In other words, you have to share your giving. You have to, you have to give, glory be to God, when you are blessed by the teaching. So we encourage you today to sow your seed. He said, and Paul said, my God, shall supply to all your need according to his riches in glory. So today we want to pray over the offering. I want to encourage you to sow a seed today in the name of Jesus. Everybody did something in Mark chapter 12. So we ask you to do something. So it's important to understand that you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. You can give without being surrendered to God, but you cannot be surrendered to God without giving. Amen. The determining factor in blessing is not in God's ability to bless you, but it's in your willingness to sow. Everything in your hand is a seed. Everything in God's hand is a harvest. When you let go what is in your hand, God will let go what is in his hand. Amen. Father God, we pray today over the giving. We ask you to bless this in the name of Jesus. Can somebody shout and say, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. 
So I'm glad you spent this day with us. So I'm going to take some questions. I see a question here by, by, um, by Jacqueline. Glory be to God. So Jacqueline asked the question. She said, Haggy, why do you advise someone who is afraid to fall in love? Well, I'm going to say something to you. First of all, fear. I mean, cautious. I would use the word cautious, not fear. I don't think that uh, falling in love, like I said in the beginning of this, of this broadcast, falling in love is easy to do. It's almost effort, effortless. But it's also not difficult, that difficult to lose that feeling. All right? So we have to be careful about, about falling in love. Falling in love is easy to do, almost effortless. But losing that loving feeling is not that hard to do either. Because emotions are generated by a chemical reaction that changes every five seconds. So if you love somebody because of what you feel, you can lose that love five minutes later. But an advice for someone who is afraid to fall in love is pray about it. Pray about it. And let God lead you. Amen. Let God, let, let God lead you in the process. All right. Now I know when you've been hurt before, you're cautious. You know, I, I was with that relationship for a long time because I had a lot of close friends that got in relationships and it didn't work very well. You know, straight out of Bible school, I saw some of my friends. I saw some of my friends fall in love quickly and it didn't work out very well. So I was very slow to fall in love. I took my time. So I understand that. And uh, so take your time. Take your time. I would say build relationships, pray about it, let God lead you. Listen, and I will advise you to go to my teaching, identifying Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright. So whoever is afraid to fall in love, let them listen to that teaching. It will help them tremendously. You know, and my first teaching that I did before that was falling in love. So my advice for someone who's afraid to fall in love is pray about it, seek God about it, Listen to the teaching, and I believe God will lead you. If anybody else has a different question, please let me know. If you don't have a question, I'm going to log off. God bless you. We're in California. The power of God is moving. Our next city is going to be Shafter. You can find us the schedule of our meetings on the website. The blind are seen, the deaf are hearing. God is doing signs, wonders, and miracles. We're so thankful for what God is doing. And uh, so I want to encourage all of you. Um, Rosie, we look forward to see you soon. Amen. Glory be to God. So we love you guys. Shafter is our next stop. Amen. Shafter is our next stop. Our next stop in, Cal stop in California. God is doing many signs and wonders. People are getting healed. And we are thankful for that. Thank you for your prayers. Well, God bless you. I'm looking forward to be with you, only with you next Saturday. We're going to continue our teaching. Loving your man, loving your woman. Invite somebody, tag somebody on this video. Amen. Have a blessed day. I'm up here in California in the mountains. It's snowing. It's a beautiful day. I'm, on a, I'm, I'm looking forward to enjoying the time with my wife and my daughter. All right. God bless you. What do you do when your sexual feelings are higher and you're not married? All right. I have, some, I have a question. What do you do when your sexual feelings are high and you're not married? Well, the Apostle Paul talked about this. It says, you know, if you're burned, you need to get married. But you got to use self-control. 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 You know? Sexual gratification as a Christian, it's only for the context of marriage. All right. So if you uh, and if you if you have sexual desire and you're burning, the Bible says you have to get married. All right. But there's a grace for you to be able to be stay, stay sexually pure, se sexually pure, even when you're not married. Ask God for the grace. Amen. It's very important to, to stay pure. 
All right, I hope that answers your questions. Amen. God bless you. Love you all. See you Saturday. Set the reminders. Take care. Listen, if I, your comment does, does not apply on the screen, does not appear on the screen, it's because you have to give permission to StreamYard, you know, to, to display your comments. So some of you are commenting, but it does not come in on the stream. That's why. All right. God bless you. Love you. Bye. Take care.